Well, good morning, y'all. I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 19. As we continue our study in this fantastic book, <clears throat> in our big picture diagram, we have uh, come to the end of the tribulation period in uh, chapter 18. And today we're going to be looking at chapters 19 and 20, which will take us through the end of the millennium, the revelation concerning the millennium. Uh, it includes uh, the, the, the second coming of Christ first, uh, and then uh, chapter 20 deals with the millennial reign of Christ. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, the first section, which is really uh, a praise of God, another one in heaven over the fall of Babylon, which we read about last week in chapter 17 and 18. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. This is the, uh, the only occurrence of the word hallelujah in the New Testament and it occurred, occurs four times in this chapter. It occurs many times in the book of Psalms, of course, and uh, hallelujah means praise the Lord. So these, uh, this voice in heaven is shouting out, praise the Lord, salvation, glory, and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. And he has judged the great prostitute who was corrupting the earth with her sexual immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, hallelujah. Her smoke, that is the smoke of the destruction of the great prostitute, which was identified in chapter 17 as Babylon, rises forever and ever. Now, I'd like to take a few minutes to clarify what Babylon refers to because it has a double meaning in scripture. It refers to the physical city of Babylon on the Euphrates River that was first built uh, as the Tower of Babel in chapter 11 of Genesis, but it also represents what the city represents. So sometimes when the word Babylon is used, uh, we connect it with Babylonianism, with what uh, arose out of the city of Babylon. Similarly, sometimes we talk about Hollywood being corrupt we don't mean the actual streets being corrupt. We mean the entertainment asso uh, industry associated with the city is corrupt. Um, maybe you've heard about the two bull weevils that lived in the South. One of them went to Hollywood and became a star. And the other one stayed in the cotton fields. He was the lesser of the two weevils. <laughs> Similarly, we refer to, the, to Wall Street, not only as a particular street in New York, but as the epitome of the financial system of the United States. So when we read that Wall Street has fallen on hard times. We mean that the financial condition of the nation has fallen on hard times. Likewise, Washington is associated with politics. There's a program on television called Washington Week, and each week the commentators talk about what happened in the politics of Washington. They don't talk about what happened on the streets but Washington is associated with politics. Uh, the Cajuns say, we got the best politicians money can buy. 
And unfortunately, that's sometimes the truth. So there are two aspects of Babylonianism, what the city represents. And we saw these in chapters 17 and 18. Chapter 17 concentrates on the religion that seeks salvation by human effort rather than accepting God's provision of salvation. It's salvation by works. That goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. And uh, the second aspect of Babylonianism is the accumulation of wealth and power in order to glorify self rather than glorifying God. This too has its roots in the Tower of Babel and what the people said there, what grew out of it, and what has characterized human life really around the world since then. Both of these aspects exclude God and they together equal what the New Testament refers to as the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, it refers to this anti-God, self-sufficient attitude that has its roots in the Tower of Babel and is with us very much today. Going back to that passage in Genesis, Noah's descendants said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. They wanted to get to God on their own and let's make a name for ourselves. There's the pride coming in. We want to glorify ourselves. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar made this significant statement. Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the power, might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? So he articulates both of these aspects of Babylonianism again. It's interesting that Paul wrote to Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness, that's one aspect of Babylonianism, and worldly desires, the desire to exalt self in the place of God and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present manner, in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, even the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. So Paul warns us about these aspects of life, and they all go back to Babylon. In chapter 17 and 18, we read about the announcement of the city being destroyed and all that it stood for, and in chapter 19, we have the rejoicing in heaven over the fact that Babylon has fallen. Verse, three, or verse 4, And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, praise the Lord. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters, again like verse 1, and the sound of the mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, praise God, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. This is another proleptic or anticipatory statement. Jesus Christ is about to return to the earth. They are rejoicing over his return and the fact that he is about to reign. This is the last of 14 of these glimpses into heaven where we see praise of God in heaven in the book of Revelation. If you've been with us through this series, you, you have observed these um, bursts of praise that come from the four, 24 elders, from the four living creatures, from those who are surrounding the throne of God as they become aware of how history is unfolding. And now we have come to the last of those. 
The next section deals with the marriage feast of the Lamb. Let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, these people say. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. The Lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ. He's identified earlier as such. And his bride has prepared herself. Now, the bride appears to be the church. Christians who are called the bride of Christ in the New Testament. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, representing her purity now in heaven, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. This is another one of those blessed passages. And uh, in this case, it's those who are invited to this feast. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship this angel who was revealing this to John. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers and sisters who hold the testimony of Jesus. In Hebrews, we read that servants are sent by God to serve the saints. And that's reflected in this angel's comment about himself. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, Jesus is the whole reason for prophecy. Prophecy all points to Jesus and it all comes from Jesus. The spirit of Jesus is what, is what prophecy is all about. And as we study prophecy, uh, if we fail to miss that emphasis on Jesus, we're failing to miss what is most important. It's interesting that uh, in the ancient Near East, there were three stages to a wedding. And we find that this is played out in the future in relation to Christ and the church. The first stage was the preparation. In any ancient Near Eastern wedding, the bride was, the bride was chosen for the groom by his parents and set aside for them. This was usually done uh, by the parents uh, in good families the bride and the groom had a say about whether it would actually happen or not, but it was arranged or initiated by the parents rather than the young people themselves. In the case of Christ and the church, Christians who have been chosen by the Father are set aside for Christ by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. This takes place here and now as people hear the gospel and trust in him as their savior. They're uh, set aside for their groom, Jesus Christ. The second stage, the groom left his home with his friends and went to the bride's home and escorted her to his home. Uh, usually uh, he did this unannounced. It was a surprise when this happened. And likewise, Christ will return from heaven to earth and escort Christians to heaven at the rapture. So there's a parallel there as well. And then the, the, the wedding itself was conducted and, the, and was consummated. The third stage was the celebration after the actual wedding ceremony. The groom provided a feast for his bride and his friends that typically lasted several days. And likewise, Christ will provide this feast, the feast of uh, the Lamb for Christians on the earth at the beginning of the millennium. So you and I are going to be taken to heaven when the Lord calls us up. And then we will ever be with the Lord, Paul says. So when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, we will come back to him, with him. 
we will have resurrected immortal bodies, bodies that will not die. There will be other people on the earth with mortal bodies, like ours now, that will die. But there's going to be a great celebration that involves Jesus Christ and his bride, the church, on the earth after he comes. And uh, this is going to be at the beginning of his reign or before his reign begins. Now in the next section, we have the actual return of Christ to the earth. And this is the great climax of the book of Revelation. Everything to this point has been leading up to Jesus Christ's return, which was prophesied in the Old Testament, has been anticipated by believers throughout history, and now we read that it's happening. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. Remember, we saw another white horse and somebody riding on it in chapter 6. And that was Antichrist. He came appearing to be pure and peaceful, but really he came to set up the Jewish people for persecution. This, go this is not going to be Antichrist. This rider on the white horse is Christ himself, faithful to his promises, true to his word that he would return. In righteousness he judges and wages war against his enemies. His eyes are a flame of fire, symbolizing judgment that will come when he comes. And on his head are many crowns, these are regal crowns, the crowns that kings wear. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. In Bible times, people were often given names not right when they were born, but after their characters had developed a bit. So Jacob's name was given to him after he began to show the characteristics of a deceiver. That's what <coughs> Jacob means. And uh, the fact that no one knows the name of this white horse rider seems to indicate that it is beyond comprehension. No one can fully appreciate the character of Jesus Christ. We certainly can't now, and maybe even through eternity, we will marvel at the character and the person of Jesus Christ. There was also a feeling in John's day that if a person knew the name of a person, he had some power over that person. And uh, that will not be the case with Jesus because no one will know his name fully. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That identifies Jesus, of course, in John chapter 1. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. You'll notice it's armies. So this probably includes us, Christians, who are living in the church age now, but it also includes Old Testament believers who are coming back, who have uh, been in the grave, in a, a holding place uh, called paradise, which is not the final resting place of believers. They will be resurrected at this time and will come back with Jesus. Perhaps angels will accompany him but you'll notice that there's no fighting that these armies engage in. They're simply accompanying the great warrior. From his mouth comes a sharp sword. The word for sword here in the Greek describes a long sword that the Romans used when they killed people. So the implication is he's coming to judge. 
so that with him he might strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. This goes back to Psalm 2 that predicted that Messiah would rule with a rod of iron. That is, he would be an autocrat. Jesus will come and rule the world as a dictator, but he will be a benevolent dictator. It will be the best rule that this world has ever seen. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Another figure that the prophets use for the judgment that Jesus will effect when he comes the second time. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That can be translated on his robe, even on his thigh. Apparently the name was written on the robe that Jesus wore over his thigh as he rode this horse. King of kings and Lord of lords. So many of the ancient monarchs of history claimed this title for himself, themselves, and yet they never were, really. Antichrist will claim it for himself but he won't rule everyone. There will be believers who do not submit to him, but Jesus will be king of all kings, Lord of all lords. Jack Hayford and his wife were celebrating their anniversary and they decided to go to England to, to do that. And so they made a trip over to England and it was the year of the 25th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's reign. And uh, of course, there were a lot of celebrations and uh, glorification of Queen Elizabeth, uh, all of which is, is good, of course. But the thing that impressed Jack Hayford was that one day there's going to be a king who comes who's going to be the ruler over all. And so he wrote the song Majesty, majesty, worship his majesty. Unto him be all glory, power, and praise. That's where that song originated. Well, in verses 17 through 21, we have the destruction of the wicked on the earth that Jesus will accomplish when he returns. In the first section, we read about two assemblies. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in mid heaven, Come, assemble for the great feast of God. This is not the marriage supper of the Lamb that Jesus will celebrate with his bride, but it's another feast so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people, both free and slaves, small and great, all kinds of people who are opposed to Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus Christ comes, the nations will have gathered together in, in Palestine to oppose him. And I saw the beast uh, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the throne and against his army. This is the battle of Armageddon. And it uh, occurs in Palestine. So the first assembly is an assembly of birds to eat the flesh of those who are killed when Jesus Christ judges his enemies. Uh, Palestine, of course, is located on a land bridge between Africa and Europe and Asia. And there are probably more migratory birds that travel over Palestine every year, going north and then going south, than in any other part of the world. But there's going to be plenty for them to feast on at this time. The second assembly is um, th these armies who make war against the Lord 
and they will be destroyed. Their fate is described in the next two verses. And the beast was seized. This is Antichrist who's heading up this association of enemies of Christ. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. Remember chapter 12. By which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. We're going to read more about the lake of fire later in this chapter, but it's the final judgment place of all unbelievers. And now the beast and the false prophet are sent to their final doom. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. Simply with a word, Jesus Christ is going to annihilate his enemies. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Someone has said that the message of Revelation is very simple. Jesus wins. And that happens here. He is the victor. So, what can we learn from this chapter? How can we apply this to our lives today? Well, we too can and should praise the Lord because one day he will reign over his enemies. In our day, it's tempting to think that things are going from bad to worse. Where is this all going to end? Well, we've just read how it's going to end. <laughs> Jesus wins. We are on the victor's side. So there's no reason for Christians to be pessimistic about the future. In the short range, it may be tough. But in the long range, the future looks wonderful. Second, we can rejoice that we will one day celebrate Christ's victory with him. There's going to be a big party for us in heaven. The marriage feast of the Lamb. And uh, not much more is said about this great celebration. But uh, feasts in the ancient world sometimes lasted for days. And we've seen the parallel with the ancient Near Eastern wedding feast. It probably go on for some time. When we celebrate Jesus' victory with him on the earth. And we should worship Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Sometimes we do this in our songs. We ought to do this in our heads as well, if not with our lips, to recognize that over all the rulers of the world, over the Stalins and the Hitlers and the Putins and the Pol Pots and the Idi Amins of this world, stands Jesus Christ. And he is the victor, and therefore he is worthy of our worship. It's worth our time, my friends, to come to church on Sunday and to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Because that's what he is, and that's what he deserves. Well, the next chapter gets us into what will happen after Jesus comes to the earth, after this feast takes place, and that is his reign. He's not going to just vanish, he's going to stay on the earth. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss. Now remember what the abyss was. This, is, this was a holding place for demons where uh, the beast was confined temporarily, but uh, it's not the final place of judgment. And a great chain was in this angel's hand. He's getting ready to bind somebody. And he took hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. 
and he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Now this is amazing, isn't it? All through history, Satan has been loosed on the earth. He has gone back and forth between God's presence and us to accuse people, to make it miserable for us. <laughs> we are to resist him, of course, because he is a roaring lion, Peter wrote, seeking those who will devour him. Now he's going to be constrained for a thousand years. The world is going to look a lot different when the influence of Satan is removed for a thousand years. So that's the binding of Satan. Then we have the resurrection of tribulation saints that will occur. Then I saw thrones and they these are evidently the tribulation saints in view of what this passage continues to reveal. And they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark of their foreheads and on their hands and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So these people who have died in the tribulation will be resurrected after Jesus Christ comes back to the earth and they will reign with him on the earth for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Uh, the first resurrection is the first of two mentioned in this chapter. We'll read about the second resurrection a little later. But this is the resurrection of tribulation saints. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. This is another one of those blessed statements. Over these the second death has no power. Later we'll read that the second death means eternal punishment. It's equated with the lake of fire. First death, of course, being physical death, when our bodies and our spirits are separated. Second death being the separation of the person from God's presence forever. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So these tribulation saints will be um, raised when Christ comes back and will serve as priests of him and of Christ during the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. We too will reign with Christ, but here it's the tribulation saints that are mainly in view. And then we jump to the final judgment of Satan. When the thousand years are completed, this is the end of the millennial reign of Christ, Satan will be released from his prison, the abyss and will come out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog. Gog refers to another world leader that Ezekiel talked about in Ezekiel 38 and 39, who will rise up at the end of the millennium in rebellion against Jesus Christ. Magog refers to his land, Satan will deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. 
Just as there was a rebellion against Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, so there will be a rebellion against Jesus Christ's earthly rule at the end of the millennium. You say, how can that be? Won't everybody be, be a Christian? No. People will be born during the millennium and they will have to choose whether they will submit to Jesus Christ or not. Many of them will choose not to, even though conditions on the earth will be much, much more conducive to faith in Christ because he will be personally present. He will be ruling in righteousness. His work will be known. He will be giving direct instructions during that thousand year period. One of the reasons we have so little uh, revelation about the millennium in the book of Revelation is that Jesus Christ will be present and he'll be giving more revelation then. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now you'll notice the difference here. What devoured the enemies at the end of the tribulation? It was Jesus Christ's word that proceeded from his mouth. What devours the enemies at the end of the millennium? It's fire from heaven. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Wow. Then we have another judgment. At the end of the millennium, this is the judgment at the throne of God. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. This is evidently God the Father, or perhaps Jesus Christ himself. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 that eventually God the Father will turn over all judgment to the Son, and the Son will turn over everything to the Father. And God will be all in all, Paul wrote. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. So these are people who have not been judged before. These are all the wicked who have ever lived on the earth are raised at this time. As well, I assume, as the people who died during the millennium. And uh, the books are opened. Obviously, God doesn't need books to remember things with. This is a way of saying that our deeds are recorded in the mind of God. Columnist Bob Green of the Chicago Tribune has a theory about what's wrong with the world. He blames it on what he calls the death of the permanent record. He recalls that grade school children once lived in fear of having their bad behavior noted on the permanent record. Some of you may remember that. <laughs> because of this, people learned in their youth to stop before they did something deceitful or unethical. They didn't stop because they were so good, but for fear of having their actions written down. Today, according to Bob Green, people have come to the conclusion that there's no such thing as a permanent record. In fact, they believe no one has a right to keep track Green says that with today's emphasis on our rights and privacy, if a school child were ever threatened with something going on his permanent record, he would probably file suit under the Freedom of Information Act. 
and gain possession of his files before recess. <laughs> Behind Green's humor is an excellent point. Where there is no fear of a lasting record, people tend to do what they think they can get away with. The problem for mankind, however, is that a permanent record does exist. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, all who have, have died and are in the place of death, Hades, which is a, per, a temporary place where unbelievers go until they are judged. And they were judged, each one of them according to their deeds. Notice, according to their deeds. Judgment is always according to what a person has done. That applies to us as well as to unbelievers. Uh, Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3 and 5. And we will give an account of our lives and we will be judged by our works and given rewards or not given rewards on the basis of what we have done. The judgment seat of Christ will not determine whether a person goes to heaven or hell. That issue is settled once a person trusts in Christ as their savior. Everyone who does needs fear no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But we will have to give an account for our deeds. And that applies to every human being, whether they are believer or unbeliever. Judgment is according to deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, a way of saying that these temporary situations temporary physical death, the temporary holding place of unbelievers are cast into a permanent place, which here is called the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, separation from God forever. Hell is described in many different metaphors in the Bible. It's called outer darkness in some places. And the, the image there seems to be of a place completely removed from any light. And of course, God is light. So the light that God provides is not something that unbelievers will enjoy throughout eternity. Sometimes it's called a lake of fire, which is an oxymoron, isn't it? Whoever heard of water burning? Yet it is a place of judgment, fire. It is a place of chaos, a lake. Hell is described in other ways in other places. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now we might ask ourselves a couple questions at this point. Why is there so little revelation about the thousand year reign of Christ? It's only in one chapter in Revelation when there is so much revelation about the seven year tribulation. Chapters 6 through 18 or 19. And it's because the Old Testament contains much revelation of Christ's earthly reign. I was just reading this morning in my devotions, Jeremiah 30, 31, and 32. It's full of revelation concerning the millennium. And if you read the prophets in the Old Testament, you read all kinds of descriptions of things that are going to happen during this thousand year period. Men will beat their swords into, plow, into plowshares and study war no more, 
Isaiah wrote. Um, the, the desert will blossom like a rose. That's millennial conditions that the prophets anticipated as well. And there's so much more in the Old Testament. What we have that's new here, of course, is the duration of it, which is revealed for the first time. And for that reason, some interpreters take this number as symbolic. They say it can't mean a, a, a thousand years, literally. But why not? The other numbers in the book are to be taken literally. Seven years, three and a half years, 1,230 days, 42 months. All of those are reasonably understood uh, to be literal numbers. Another question is, is Jesus really going to come back to the earth, judge his enemies and rule for a thousand years, or is all of this just symbolic? And many Christians believe it is just symbolic of the victory of good over evil. But a literal understanding of these events is certainly possible and the revelation of them is in keeping with the revelation of other events in this book. It's all of, of a piece. It fits together. It unfolds chronologically. It makes sense if taken literally. Now, it may be helpful to, under, to, to review how other people have viewed this uh, millennial reign of Christ. Uh, amillennialism is a school of interpreters who do not believe that there will be a literal thousand year rule of Christ, hence, ah, uh, no millennium. And they believe that it is that what this chapter is describing is either Christ's present reign over the hearts of his people now, over us now, or it is a description of heaven, the eternal state. Postmillennialism is the school of belief that believes that uh, the millennium is either the present age in which we live, like the amillennialists believe, or it is a future age before Christ returns to the earth. And uh, those who believe this second aspect of postmillennialism or view of it um, believe that things are going to get better and better on the earth and that will be a millennial age of good and then Christ will return. So Christ returns after the millennium that our age leads up to, you see. The third major interpretive group is the premillennial view and it is the one that we've been setting forth in this class. It is a future age that will begin when Christ returns to the earth. In other words, his return is before pre the millennium. That when he returns he sets up this thousand year reign on the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I took a test once when I think I was in high school or something, college maybe, and they asked if I believed in the second coming of Christ. And uh, it was obviously a psychological examination that was designed to identify whether you were wacko. <laughs> I mean, only, only weird people believe that Christ is going to actually come back to the earth. Well, I'm not afraid of being called a wacko <laughs> if, if that's what's involved in it. Now, just a review of the sequence of events here. First, we have the, I've, these are all in your handout, so you don't have to copy them down. The end of the tribulation, and then follows the return of Christ to the earth with us, we will be with him. Then the defeat of Christ's enemies by his word, the Antichrist, the false prophet, 
and uh, the Antichrist's kings under his authority. Then Satan will be bound for a thousand years. Then there will be the resurrection of tribulation and Old Testament saints before the millennium begins. Old Testament saints too will receive immortal bodies. So during the millennium, there's going to be this strange mixture of people who die and people who don't die. You see. Then the marriage feast of the Lamb will take place about then, Jesus' thousand year reign on the earth. Then the rebellion at the end of the millennium in which Gog is destroyed. Then the destruction of Jesus' enemies by fire from heaven the great white throne judgment of all the wicked and the final judgment of Satan. So what? Faithful believers will share in the glorious reign of Christ on earth so we can be positive about the future. Second, even under much better conditions on the earth, people will still rebel against God and reject Christ. So we see that ideal conditions do not result in godliness, only regeneration does. Just think about it, during the millennium, Satan will be bound. John wrote that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. All of these are active in the world today uh, the world will be judged when Babylonianism is destroyed. The religious, commercial, economic system that has driven this planet since the Tower of Babel will be changed by Christ. And self-seeking materialism will not characterize life in the millennium. John tells us how to resist the world. He says, do not love it. Do not love the world, neither the things of the world, for the world is passing away and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Satan will be bound. So the only problem people will have in the millennium is their own sinful nature with which we are all born. <laughs> My friend John Cooper, who is an Aggie, remember that said he became convinced of the depravity of humanity when his third son, Bradley, was born. He went to visit Bradley in the hospital and in his little crib, he was raising <laughs> the hook em horn sign. <laughs> People are still going to rebel against God even though Satan's influence and the world's influence will be not what they are now because they will have a sinful human nature. Everyone will stand before God one day and be judged for his works. So we need to be careful about how we live. I just finished reading a biography of a very interesting man named Nelson Bell, who was uh, Billy Graham's uh, father-in-law. Dr. Bell was a surgeon who served most of his life in China during the 1930s in the town of Sing Puing, no, Sing, help me here, uh, Sing Taoing Pu wherever that is. <laughs> and uh, he was in charge of a 360 bed hospital there. There were seven doctors, surgeons, four of them Chinese, three of them Americans. Uh, if you want to be inspired by a life, read this book. I mean, this man was the ideal Christian. It's amazing. And uh, when he stands before the Lord, I'm sure he's going to be given a great reward. He also founded the magazine Christianity Today with his son-in-law, Billy Graham.
in the 50s. Great, great book called A Foreign Devil in China. That's how the Chinese looked at foreigners at the time. But they greatly respected him. He lived through the Japanese war that uh, uh, involved China at that time and eventually had to, had to leave the country. But uh, he's a great example for us of a person who lived with eternity's values in view because we will have to give an account for our, our deeds. And uh, that should determine how we approach each day. Well, next week we'll f finish up the book of Revelation, the Lord willing, with a view of heaven, chapters 21, and then the conclusion of the book. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for giving us this encouraging, inspiring, challenging section of your revelation that sees the vindication of the one that we have come to love and to serve, the one who is despised and rejected on the earth now, the one who is ignored and yet one day will return and receive the praise on the earth that he so rightly deserves. May we be those who worship him now and serve him with our whole hearts. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.